Good evening and welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Nick Viest and I'm chairman of Community Board 8. Community Board 8 covers basically the Upper East Side of Manhattan from 59th to 96th Street, Park to the River, and it also includes Roosevelt Island. This is part two of our discussion with Sam Schwartz, also known as Gridlock Sam. We're very pleased to have him with us uh, tonight to talk about a number of traffic issues and a plan that he has been talking about uh, all over uh, the, the, the city of New York. So just to give uh, the viewers uh, some of his background, Sam was New York City's traffic commissioner uh, starting 1982 to 1986, then became the Department of Transportation chief engineer, uh, first deputy, and also first deputy commissioner. He has a firm now called Sam Schwartz Engineering, and they've got six offices around the country. In our last show, we actually talked about Sam coining the phrase gridlock. Uh, very fascinating uh, discussion about it, but Sam came up with it. We didn't have that word before Sam came up with it, and now he spent his life trying to prevent gridlock. So, so with that, we'll, we'll continue in our last discussion talking about this plan that Sam has uh, put together, his group has put together, in order to try to get more equity in, in the way we told, but also a better system of dealing with the costs and the revenues associated with our transportation system, and specifically with the bridges, and how people go into Manhattan. So, so let's talk a little bit about, you, we talked about the current system in the last meeting, uh, and, and you're unhappy with the way it's set up. Talk about this issue of sustainability. If we leave things the way they are, people say, well, I don't think we really need to change it, okay? W what happens? W w why is it important now to, to take a look at this? It's, it's important now for a number of reasons. First of all, the MTA's capital plan runs out at the end of this year, so we have to come to grips with it uh, rather quickly. Uh, secondly, the formula that has been in place since 1968 when Nelson Rockefeller created the MTA is to take the excess revenue from the tolls and give that money to the uh, transit authority. And that's worked for 46 years. For better or worse, it's worked. But the tolls are getting to a point where people are clamoring for relief and side deals are being cut. For example, to get to and from Staten Island, it's $15 by car, cash, 1066 Easy Pass. But to take a truck into Staten Island, uh, a, fi a five axle truck, it's $80. Remarkable. And if that, same, if that same truck goes through Manhattan, it's zero. So if that truck is going from Brooklyn to Newark Airport, if it goes over the Verrazano Bridge, it'll pay $80. If it'll go over the Manhattan Bridge and out the, the Lincoln Tunnel or the Holland Tunnel, zero. Right. So, what, I mean, what is the logic to that? Is there any logic to that that you can see? No. I mean, first of all, I don't understand how anybody could stay in business paying $80 every time you have to go over the Ver Verrazano Bridge. And if you look at the port in Staten Island, the port is crippled. I mean, they have lost so much business because they're paying tolls on both sides right. of that. So, so it's really been unfair that... That part of the city gets told that the Throgs Neck and the Whitestones and the Mill Basins and the Rockaways get told, but a lot of people just can't come freely into Manhattan, and it's caused a, a major problem for Manhattan. The other reason it's not sustainable uh, is that uh, the next time there's a toll increase, which is March of 2015, and that's only around the corner, the tolls are going to be increased again to $16 at the these facilities, maybe even $17. Wow. And I mean, that's, the, a, that's a lot of money. And so the governor cut a deal a few months ago with Staten Island. The people in Brooklyn said cut a deal with us. The people in the Rockaways have a side deal. The people on both sides of the Tappan Sea have side deals. You can't run government with side deals. It's yeah. And the reason you have the side deals is because this is a bad formula. Right, so it's really, it's really what, what's happening is they're patching it, essentially. So they're taking a bad a system that's inefficient, and they're just putting patches on it. But in the meantime, so the prognosis is really, you're just going to keep having to figure out how to patch it, but the costs are still going to go up, and what you're going to have is this 
sort of disequilibrium between these outer, these other bridges, say Staten Island or, or in parts of Queens going to the Bronx, they're going to be paying exorbitant amounts and then compared to what the, the bridges where you have no toll at all. Exactly. So this is the problem. What you're saying, I, I think what I understand you're saying is it can't continue that way. The gap is going to continue to increase. And, and for example, you, you make a, an interesting point. Port Elizabeth is a major port that serves the, the Northeast. It, uh, vessels come into that port and serve all kinds of businesses up and down the East Coast, not just, you know, not just in this immediate area, but going out to Pennsylvania, up into upstate New York, part, even parts of New England. And so now you're creating this impediment. We have this impediment, and something has to be looked at to try to figure out a better way to, to look at it, I guess. Yeah, and, and it is, as you, as you point out, commerce is, is what really gets crippled. It's bad enough for the, for the, for the drivers, but truckers are getting clobbered with these right. tolls. Every time the MTA needs money, truckers are contributing. Drivers that have nothing to do with the central business district are contributing. Their elected officials are going to say it's going to be like a scene out of network. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Right. I have one more question. Um, before I get to that, though, I, I did forget to introduce our co-chair of the Transportation Committee, Scott Falk. We're very pleased. He's here. He has a lot of insights about traffic. Uh, he does a fine job running our committee. Uh, he's going to be taking over with a number of questions uh, after I uh, finish up on this particular plan. Um, but the, the final question I want to ask is one, and we talked about this at the break, which is this is a political problem as much as anything. Looking at the math, you can see how the math adds up. But the problem is going out and telling folks, well, you, you, you are going to pay more. Some of you may pay less over, the, over time. So there's a question that comes up also, which, which, which when we, our board, voted on this, and by the way, our board voted to, to support the concept of what Sam's group is doing here, um, the question of equity came up for folks who are uh, you know, limited means and are currently coming in not paying a toll. A lot of people feel this is an undue burden for those folks. Can, can you talk to that point a little bit? Sure. First of all, the majority of the money goes to transit. The majority of the people of lower income, uh, that's how they get around. When you look at the distribution, people of the lowest economic classes are relying on our buses more than almost anybody else is. They're relying on our subways with many other people. Very few of them can afford to drive into Manhattan Central Business District. Remember, we're not saying driving into Manhattan. We're saying driving into Manhattan south of 60th Street to A, drive in, B, park the car. The parking lots are providing congestion pricing already. Right. It is, it is now there are some not far from Board 8. I, I parked in Board 8. My son lives in Board 8. And I just parked for an hour. It was $80 near because I was visiting my grandson at, in Central Park. So it's hard to imagine that there are, are a lot of lower income people that are coming into Manhattan and parking their cars in Manhattan. Uh, there may be some that come in very late at night. And that's why we think that there might be some time of day relief right. for some people. But for the most part, uh, the days of low-income people driving into Manhattan and parking in the central business right. district, that's over. But just a final point on that issue is that in, in this issue of equity, so what you're really talking about, though, is a, a being able to allocate capital fairly but also efficiently so that, so that when you're able to support some of the public transportation that's out there to help those folks. So with the misallocation of, of capital, it, it ends up raising the cost across the board. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yes, absolutely. But this targeting um, the benefits to the people that are paying is also very important. And so many of the benefits that we're looking at have equity as a, as a um, main element and also have equity in terms of who's paying as an element. So, for example, in the Bronx, we support the governor's plan to add a number of Metro North stops that will bring people directly from the South Bronx and from uh, Co-op City into Penn Station. 
uh, that's going to benefit just about everybody. We need to have ways of getting people in. We support expansion of the Second Avenue subway into Harlem. That makes eminent sense. And right now, there's no money to do either of those things that I was talking about. Right. So on the topic of the Second Avenue, since you bring up a phase two of the yes. subway, um, we're nearing the completion of phase one construction. Um, and theoretically, we're just over two years away from the launch of the first um, you know, fare being paid on the Q train on the Upper East Side. Um, so first of all, can you tell me about what Sam Schwartz Engineering did for uh, the Second Avenue subway project or is now doing? Sure. Um, the MTA uh, Capital Construction Group is our client, and they brought us in partly because there was a very angry community. There was very lousy press that they were getting. And they felt that they needed to, they wanted to be a better neighbor, and they wanted to somehow communicate better. So they called upon us to, to launch something called the Good Neighbor Initiative. And that increased communications. As you probably know, we have these quarterly uh, workshops in which we get together, and we have different themes for those workshops. We've had monthly meetings based on each station location. We've had massive communications. We've taken several thousand people now down into the hole to, to see what's going on. Uh, we've addressed some of the complaints such a, that were related to the blasting, to the dust, to the noise. You, not that everybody is happy, otherwise why would we get 100 people from the Upper East Side showing up and giving up their evenings to visit us? Uh, but we've been able to deal with a lot of the more serious issues, issues of lighting and cleanliness. At our quarterly meetings, we have everybody from the DOT, MTA to the RAT squad is right. out there right. so that they hear directly from the community. We've opened a community center, which I invite everybody to come and visit uh, on 2nd Avenue near 86th Street. And it's wonderful, and, you'll, you'll, and there we give uh, lectures there, but you also see the progress. And we are so excited that in about two years, the end of 2016, the train will run, and it's not just the Second Avenue subway. It's linking the Upper East Side to Coney Island. It's linking the Upper East Side to Greenwich Village. Uh, you're going to have stops, so one train, one seat stop to all of these neighborhoods, to Times Square, to Herald Square. Uh, so it's really wonderful for the Upper right. East Side. And, you know, my son lives on the Upper East Side, so for me, finally, we can solve the diagonal problem of how do you get to the Upper East Side to the West Side where I live. It's, a, it's actually, it is a fantastic thing in terms of what it will do because New York has very good service north and south, but really crummy service going across town. And it's always been a challenge for people living on the east side to get over to the west side, especially if they have to get over just to Penn Station. Yeah. That's always been a pain in the neck. It's actually, sometimes it's three trains, okay, if you, mm -hmm. if you do it certain it ways. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, so it's, mu it's certainly much needed and I think very welcome. I will say as the chair of the board, it, the, the problem of the second every subway for the residents and the businesses there has been very difficult. And we, we, we've worked very hard to try to respond to those. We appreciate the fact that you're reaching out uh, to, to people to, to deal with that proactively as best you can. Some of these things may not be mitigatable at the end of the day because it's such a major construction. We, we haven't experienced this in our mm -hmm. lifetimes in, in, in Manhattan, as far as I, I can think, anything like that. So I, I don't know that these things are mitigatable, but they are, there are problems that can be dealt with. And by being proactive, I think that's really the best approach uh, to, to do it. So we, we, do, we certainly appreciate that. And if folks have problems uh, relating to the secondary subject, get a hold of the community board office. Give us a call uh, at, at our number, 212-758-4340. Uh, I'll let Scott go back to his, his questioning, a little bit of a plug yeah. there. Well, so, um, so let's, let's actually shift um, several feet north uh, of the um, subway construction. Let's talk about the f surface of Second Avenue because obviously there's been this construction going on 
for a long time on Second Avenue, and the community has, you know, suffered through this uh, sort of Frankenstein monster of a Second Avenue surface street while construction's happening. But I think what we'll see is one of our biggest issues over the next two years is the restoration of Second Avenue. Do you have any insight into um, what um, we'll be looking at um, in terms of planning for the new avenue? Um, maybe what opportunities we have for rethinking um, that avenue? Yes, uh, and, and in fact, we have a, a meeting, one of our quarterly meetings, I believe it's around October, October 27th, I'm not sure of the date, but uh, we are working with some people in the community to talk about uh, the countdown for the opening of Second Avenue, but also the opportunity that shouldn't be missed as to what Second Avenue should look like. And the current plans without having this collective influence uh, is to restore what was there. Maybe the pavement will look better um, and You'll, you'll have a bicycle lane and you'll have a, a bus lane, but uh, there are options. Maybe we should have different street lighting. Maybe we should have different plantings along 2nd Avenue, uh, textured sidewalks, and uh, um, where the bike lanes and the bus lanes will, will go uh, on that. Uh, we also have a, a, a gap issue, and the gap issue is that the MTA is going to restore fully sidewalks and um, roadway uh, in the areas that it has worked and a little bit extended beyond that and a little bit into the side streets. But they haven't worked everywhere in Second Avenue. They may have been digging below. So meetings are going on with the DOT and I think it's very important that the community be involved at this point because we should look for a grand opening of Second Avenue and just to give you a sense of the timing, it's going to come after completion of the subway. So while the okay. subway will open in December 2017, I would say there's probably a six-month lag before everything is completed on the surface of it. But I think it's December 2016 leading into did January Did I say 2017? I think so. I meant so, yeah. 2016. <laughs> yes, I, and we're still on slip. schedule, right? That's been the date. December in... 2016, That's yeah. the, we're, we have a countdown clock at the, right. communi the community center. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I was thinking, Jan yeah. I'm really yeah. thinking January yeah. 2017. Yeah. Okay. So, but it's the year of 2017 that we want to complete Second Avenue, and this is a great time for the community to get involved. Right, so that, and that raises uh, interesting issues about what can be done with Second Avenue, uh, and, and you talk uh, talk about plantings and things like that. But it, it, there's some really creative things that could be done to improve the streetscape of I, Second Avenue. Uh, Scott, I, I don't think, know if you have any thoughts on, yeah, on so this I've, issue. I've made this observation before, but it, it kind of um, ties in with something you said in the first. Um, half hour, which is, uh, you know, you talked in the past about when you um, widen a street, you know, you end up inducing traffic, you induce demand. What we've actually had is the opposite in some ways on Second Avenue, that we've had many years where Second Avenue has been constricted um, and there has been less um, throughput of cars and therefore that may have had an effect on the demand and that I think we need to be very careful not to simply create a whole new demand by just going back to having a five lane highway that carries people north of our community to get down south of our community. You know, this should be, I think, an avenue that serves the community's need um, as opposed to just trying to restore something that used to be, you know, maybe about getting people from up north to down south quickly. Yeah, those are, that's an important point. We have lived with far less capacity all these years. It, you know, it has not uh, been a catastrophe uh, in terms of traffic. So I would agree that we certainly don't need to go back to the days where we need as many lanes on 2nd Avenue, but the community really should play a, a major role in that as well as the community board should be a leader in that. And I guess, I guess it cuts across two boards also because the reconstruction work would go north of 96 yeah. to, so 11 I believe, 105th right. Street. Right, right. right. Now, um, 
On another topic, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, two things I think that go together. One is Vision Zero, you know, the mayor's initiative to try to reduce um, traffic fatalities to zero over the coming decade. Um, and the other is the topic of home rule over New York City streets. So maybe we can start by talking about how did the state get so much control over the traffic laws in New York City? Actually, it's just the opposite in a way. Uh, if uh, traffic laws are state functions. In, fi in 50 states, the, the federal government has ceded traffic laws over to the states. Uh, New York City in the 1950s or so got a law passed, and I'm trying to remember the number, something, I believe it's Section 1278, which allows New York City to promulgate its own rules and regulations. And the way the law is written is, in New York State, cities with a population of more than one million can do this, and New York is the only one that can do it. So we really have a, a lot of liberties that other places, Schenectady, Syracuse, don't have. We don't have to go back to the state for most things. However, when it came to lowering the speed limit, for some reason, uh, we thought we had to ask the state for permission to do it. Uh, when I was traffic commissioner, I would have just done it if that was on, <laughs> yeah. on my, right. my plate and let the state challenge it. Uh, I think the, state, the city can set speed limits, and maybe there is some arcane rule that says that they can't, but I set speed limits all the time when I was traffic. So, so commission. talk a little bit about that speed limit. Let's let. Uh, does it? Do you believe? Are you in favor of it? Number one, of lowering it. Um, what, what are your thoughts about how that I impacts uh, safety and all kinds of other factors in, the, in, in our city? I would like people to drive more slowly. Does just putting up a sign make people drive more slowly? There is no supporting evidence that shows that. So uh, what there is supporting evidence is that red light cameras do stop people from running red lights or, or reduce it. Uh, speed cameras do lower the speeds. Uh, tough enforcement does lower the speeds. Signs alone, general regulations and rules, they don't. And in fact, what it creates is this thing where more people violate the law and therefore have less respect for the law. In three quarters of the city, there hasn't been an accident probably or crash. We don't use the word accident anymore the century in most of the city in low volume areas. So why fix something that's that's not broken? It's really concentrated in certain areas. Study where it's concentrated, study the types of crashes. We've seen uh, a number in uh, the Upper East Side has seen some of these terrible truck crashes. Right. Well, the truck crashes are often right turning trucks and the uh, the front of the, the truck passes the individual, but it's the rear that strikes the individual. Well, we can deal with that. Europe has solved that by putting up rear guards on the wheels. The person would still get hit, but we get hit and thrown away instead of hit and crushed. Right. And we've seen too many of these crushed situations. Even recently, a woman crushed under a city bus. Right. Um, so. Apply some science. It really is the science of traffic safety, the politics of traffic safety. I don't, I appreciate political interest in it, but how about listening to the scientists who have studied this for for decades and really know the answers. Yeah. Community Board 8 actually did pass a, a set of um, three resolutions a few months ago about underside um, you know, wheel guards, um, rear and mm -hmm. side guards. Um, and actually one thing that we've asked for that I haven't really heard the city talking about as part of Vision Zero is not just putting these on trucks, but putting them on buses. On city buses. Right? Yes. Yeah. So that's something that we hope we will um, see get more traction, so to speak. Let's talk for just a minute about um, bikes. You mentioned that you know there may be a bike lane planned for Second Avenue to pair with the First Avenue bike lane um, that they put in with the Select Bus Service redesign. Uh, what about bike share? Do you see um, do you see bike share coming to our neighborhood soon? Oh, I, I hope so. I, I still have to either take my car or to visit my son or try, try to figure out that diagonal movement from the Lower West Side to the Upper East Side. Uh, I ride bike share a good deal. 
I think it's a <coughs> terrific form of transportation, solve the crosstown problem. Uh, uh, there are so many problems with the current provider of bike share. Uh, there are financial problems. There needs to be an infusion of funds. The price is going to go through the roof for the people that are using it. Talk about equity. It's really uh, the lowest economic classes are not using right. bike share. Right. It is for a certain group of people. And tourists Me, and so on too. I, I'm right. doing great with bike share. Right. But we, uh, I do hope to see it on the Upper East Side. I hope to see it on the Upper West Side because my daughter lives on the Upper West yeah. Side. So, right. so maybe you'd uh, use your car less often to travel to the Upper East and Upper West Side. Exactly. Okay. Well, that right. might be something we can do to to chip away at traffic. Good. I think that that pretty much is the end of our time today. But I really appreciate your coming and having uh, two conversations with us today. Uh, Sam Schwartz, Gridlock Sam. Uh, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate um, the opportunity to talk about the Move New York plan and all these other transportation topics in our neighborhood. You're quite thank, welcome. Thank, thank you very much, Sam. It was too short. Yes. <laughs> I can be back. <laughs> we will ask you back.